<laughs> and on tech support is coming. Tech support. No, we're there. We're there. We're up and running. We're up and running. Thanks. There we go. Well, thank you, um, and good evening, and thank you for having me here. Uh, it has been, it's an honor to be able to speak to people who have passion for history as much as, as I do, uh, but it, mine comes from a whole different perspective as yours, as you spend many times uh, digging into the, into the dirt. Uh, I dug into the dirt of evidence, but never got myself, my, my hands really dirty until I actually died the anchor itself. But um, really, I, this, this concept has been, if, and I, as I built my, my thoughts on this process, it really is, is anchored in evidence. It's a, there we go. But th let me tell you a little bit about myself. I am not a professional historian, I'm not even close. Uh, I'm a Northwest native, my family's been here since the 1880s on both sides. Uh, my grandpa was the first All-American at the University of Washington in football. Uh, um, so it's, and, and my great-grandfather my, my, uh, great on my mother's side owned a couple of the piers, Pier 3, which is now Pier 54, uh, and the last name was Galbraith, and they were, they were merchant, mercantile. They, they, they hauled stuff around the morning and they sold you know, all the things they needed, they made a fortune. Uh, selling to the to the gold miners as they came in here in the late 1890s, um, so they did they did pretty well. I'm a medical device salesman. I sell I sell I've sold for years. I sold a device that cooled people after cardiac arrest. I now sell a device that that illuminates veins right before right so people can get your lines in without causing too much pain. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, I'm a passion student history. I, I read a lot on the American Revolution, the Civil War, uh, World War II. Uh, and uh, especially the Lewis and Clark expedition because it's so dear to our hearts and everything it impacts us and touches us in so many ways. And as a medical device salesman, I travel around the Pacific Northwest and I carry with me at all times uh, Stephen Ambrose's uh, Undying Courage. It's, it's very dog-eared. I read it 10 times now. Uh, and I pull it up whenever I'm in a particular area and reread that spot so that I can visualize what, what Lewis and Clark were doing or what Lewis was doing at that particular moment. Uh, and then I was also, and I've been a, a, an advocate of the Vancouver Expedition. I got interested in that a little bit later on. I, I was always a history buff. Um, the Jesuit fathers at Seattle Prep, Seattle University, and got me interested in history. Uh, and and I and I was, but I was still just a political science major. But I was taking history courses on the side. For the Vancouver Expedition, I was given a chart, a, a marine atlas by Stephen Hilson. I mean, probably, some of you folks probably have seen it. It's a, it's a chart of the Pacific Northwest all the way from Olympia to the Queen Charlotte's. And it has in it, Stephen Hilson put in the excerpts from the, from the, uh, the Spanish expedition of the Mexicana and the Sudo, uh, as well as the Vancouver expedition. And so in different places, wherever that place was, they would give a reference to what was going on at that particular time. And then that got me going with the Vancouver Expedition and reading the journals, reading Vancouver's journal, reading Edmund Meany's uh, treatise of 1907, etc. So how did this all happen? Uh, Doug Monk, my partner, is a commercial diver. Uh, he now does uh, derelict net uh, recovery. He's a, he, that's really all he does now, and crab pot, derelict crab pot recovery work. But, but for years, he was doing uh, uh, sea cucumbers and he was harvesting those, and as a surface air diver, you would dive down, walk along the bottom, be weighted, and walk along and, and pick them and put them in his basket. Well, as he was working off of, of the northwest side of Whitby Island, the, uh, the current was driving his line down, which is not normal, but it drove it down and he got caught on something. And he walked back uh, about 100 feet, pulled along the line to try and free it up, and he found a huge blob four by four of barnacles. As a matter of fact, it was, he, he didn't know what it was at first. Walked along it, finally saw some anchor chain, and he saw the shank, and then realized he found an anchor. He reported back up, he has a mic system, reported up, thinking, hey, I think I found an anchor. They marked it, didn't think, didn't think anything about it. Until a couple weeks later, somebody said, well, maybe this is the anchor to the HMS Chapman. This is after it's been cleared off, by the way. It was this whole area 
was completely surrounded by barnacles, which we believe is 222 years worth of growth. Um, and so he could, he could not even tell what it was. You can see what the visibility was like. Uh, it, it's in any, on a good day, it's 8 to 10 feet. You might get up to 12 feet. That's a really, really good day, uh, especially in the winter months or when, they, when we aren't having any of the algae blooms. Uh, he found this during that time. But most of the time, it's 6 to 8 feet at best. So you can kind of get the visual. That's, that, that's a picture taken from about 4 feet away. So I think it, this is why he, he, he said he worked this area probably 45 to 50 times for sea cucumbers and never run into it. But pretty amazing. And in that depth, you could walk right by it and never see it. You'd only be a couple feet away. So kind of this is what he started looking at, saw the ring and the shank. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was fascinating. He's, he's, he, somebody mentioned this could be the anchor. He started doing research on his own. <laughs> he kind of suspected it might be, but it, he kept being told that it was in the wrong spot. So let's talk a little bit, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit. Most, a lot of people really don't know a lot about the Vancouver Expedition. How they know that they came here, etc. But most people don't know why they came here in the first place. The, the expedition of 1791 to 1795 was precipitated by both uh, they thought were going to be certain hostilities between the Spanish government and the British government over what happened with, with the claim by Captain John Mears that, that he had land and property taken from him from the Spanish up in the up in the Sound. So they were commissioned in, during the uh, three commissions or three conventions where they settled the, the dispute. And the Spanish agreed to return all their all the properties back to them. And and in 1791. Uh, late 1790, or excuse me, uh, late 1790, uh, Vancouver was commissioned to go to the Pacific Northwest to take reclaim or take uh, control of the properties at into the Sound, as well as he was also charged by the Admiralty to explore and survey the entire area. Remember this: that in the seven, late mid to late 1770s, this area had been visited by James Cook three times, uh, but they didn't do any extensive extensive work during that, that period. There's two ships. There was the HMS Discovery. That was the, the flagship. That was Vancouver's boat. It wasn't very big. It was, seven, it was only 100 feet long, 330 tons of burden. Pretty heavy for a 100 foot boat. But that's what it could carry overall with as long as its weight, 330 tons. Had a crew of 100. Now it had a deck length of 80 feet. Think about that. 100 <laughs> men in 80 feet of space. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty tight. It's pretty tight quarters. Uh, they had 10 four pounder cannon commanded by Vancouver. The Chatham was built in 1788 in Dover. Uh, it was a survey ship. It was, it was originally purchased, it was going to be a merchant ship, but then was purchased by the Royal Navy and outfitted uh, uh, in Dover. Uh, it was a two masted brig uh, survey ship. Uh, it was considered the armed escort to the, for the expedition. Think about this 1788, what happened? Mutiny on the bounty. So that this was the next expedition that the, the Admiralty commissioned. So they, they ordered that, that all expeditions, all survey expeditions, be, be assisted, escorted by an armed tender. So the ship had, had four uh, three-pounders, six swivel guns, notice anti-personnel weapons. So that was to stop in the event of, a, of a, either, either uh, potential problems with the, with the natives and or other, the men on the other ships. Or the other ship. It was commanded by William Broughton, had a crew of 45. It was 80 feet long, and it only had a deck length of about 60 feet. So once again, very tight. They had 10 Marines on board who were the, the armed escort part. Uh, pretty interesting. I don't have any pictures of yours, Bill, but I only got a Stephen Mayer's picture, so we'll have to go with those. The ship, the expedition departed England in April of 1791. They made their way down south. They actually stopped in Madeira. Uh, and and uh, they had well, they had some they had some problems with the crew. Uh, a couple of couple of men got drunk. So officers got got uh, well. The men got drunk. Some of them got one of them got pushed into the into the drink by a Spanish soldier. And there was some close. They came to real problems. They got the heck out of it. They hightailed it out of there and headed south. They went around the the, the, the Cape. Uh, and headed and explored the south, uh, south portion of Australia and New Zealand. They were really kind of capping off what, what uh, uh, Cook had done 
in 20 years, 18 years earlier, they, to kind of finish that, that and, and to explore new islands. They, explore, they, they started the Chatham Islands, which the ship uh, Chatham is named after. Um, and they arrived in Hawaii in 1791. In the spring, they, they made landfall, they took off, they made landfall about 39th parallel, and which is about Cape Mendocino, and then worked their way north along, along the coast. They missed discovering the Columbia. They passed right by it, too much fog. Uh, didn't recognize that there was, there was outflow from the, from the river, surprisingly. They kept on going. They ran into uh, Captain Gray, right at this point, just, uh, just, just north of, of the Columbia River, where they stopped, exchanged information and pleasantries. Um, Captain Gray really thought that they were trying to, <laughs> he followed them for a little bit because he really thought they were what they were doing was trying to cut into his trade. He was a trade, he was a, he was a, a, a trader, a fur trader. So he was a little bit concerned. It was kind of an interesting exchange. But it was very pleasant, very cordial. They finally, they entered the strait in late April of 1792. And in, in early or, or early May, they entered Puget Sound. They, they anchored off of, of just west of Fort Townsend by uh, Discovery Bay, as well as Protection Island, and then made their way down and explored. The ships split, the Chatham going north to to visit into the area of uh, the San Juan Islands while the Discovery headed south, anchored off of the uh, Restoration Point, which is the southeast side of Bainbridge Island. After that, they came out, they surveyed the Gulf Islands, they surveyed the Strait of, Strait of Georgia with the Spanish, ran into the Spanish in Mexico and the Sudo just a couple of days uh, into, into the month of June uh, and they had conversations with them actually exchanged information, sailed together, very pleasant. It was a very cordial relationship. As a matter of fact, in the journals, you, you, you got the sense that Captain Vancouver was, was really liked the skippers on, on both ships. Yeah, but they, um, did they have the Spanish fort in Nia Bay at the time? Say again? The Spanish fort in Nia Bay, you know, they went... Yes, they did, and then they had the they had fort there, they bypassed that. They, they, and then they, uh, and there was also obviously the fort up in Nootka Sound in Friendly Cove. Because they weren't there very long. No, very short. Uh, and then finally, and during this time from, from 1792 to 1795, they returned to Hawaii twice and then came back, uh, made their way back, and they surveyed as far north as Cook Inlet, Turnigan Arm, Knick Arm, uh, that, that entire area before they finally returned uh, by way of Cape Horn, one around the other way. George Vancouver was a very young man when, when this happened. You'll notice he was born in 1757. So effectively, he was about 34, 35 years old uh, when, he was the, when he was made captain of this expedition. And uh, 33 at the time he received it. I think he was one of the most underrated English explorers. Everybody knows about King James Cook. James Cook was the celebrity. He was the Hollywood hero of the, Brit of the British royalty as well as the, as the nobility. He had to be very well connected, um, yeah, but he, but uh, Cook wasn't. Or I mean, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Vancouver was not. He was not well known. Uh, he was not well connected, and um, he apprenticed under Cook in the second and third voyages. Got a lot of experience in surveying on that. He surveyed surveyed in detail that California to Alaska coast, but he also surveyed the south coast of Africa. He he kind of, uh, commanded a sloop called the Martin where he, right before this expedition, uh, he, he, he served that area. And then he also surveyed South Australia and, and New Zealand as well. And he was, really was overshadowed, as I mentioned, by, by Cook's exploits. He died before he could publish the journals. You know, being, a, being a, an officer, being a sailor in those days, was, it was hard duty. It was, big, it was heavy duty. Think about this. Coming into, coming into the Pacific Northwest in April, or even in March, and how miserable that had to be. The rain, the cold, 45, 50 degrees at best. Uh, it was very tough on him, on, on, on uh, Cook, or excuse me, on, on Vancouver. And he passed away in 1798 before his journals were published, three years after he returned. He was considered a tough but fair captain, at least in my estimation. Sure, there was discipline. There was discipline issues. There's always discipline issues. But you take a look at the amount of discipline meted out, the number of lashings that occurred to the common sailor, and they weren't any different than any other, than any other skipper of, the, of that day. 
Meany describes it best as a great and big man, and I really do agree with that in Meany. Okay, so where was the anchor lost? Well, we know this. We, the ships completed their exploration, weeks of exploration for in, in March, and in the, in the first couple of days on June 5th, they exited uh, the, the Tulalip, Indian, or Tulalip area, they exited Tulalip Bay, as a matter of fact. The ships went down, we had the, the Chatham entered on May 23rd, and explored the northern reaches all the way up to, it, they didn't quite get up back up to Deception Pass, but they got to Skagit Bay, uh, they ran aground there, they, they cleaned it up while they were aground, came back out. The two ships met in e at my Everett at Skagit Bay, where they formally took uh, possession of the, of the land, like, you know, George was wearing his red coat, and they, they, they land, planted the flag over King of Country, and all that good stuff. On their way out, on the 5th of June, the weather was gorgeous by our standards. It was dead flat calm, moderate weather, about 65 degrees, uh, but they had a problem. They didn't have any wind. So as they left and worked their way around, they, they, got, uh, they got caught in this, this heavy, heavy current and no winds. Uh, so they really sl struggled. They slugged their way uh, up to Admiral the Inlet, and then, or Admiral the Head got out of there, got stuck on the, off the point, uh, from Point Partridge, the northwest side of Whidbey Island, for a day and a half. They got stuck in the currents. We'll talk about those in a quick second. And then while on June 9th, while they were, while the Chatham was trying to attempt to get to Cypress Island along with the, or to meet the, meet the uh, discovery, uh, they lost their anchor. They got caught in a big current, no wind, uh, dropped their anchor, the and cable parted. And, there was, and that was that, the anchor was gone. The conventional wisdom has always believed that the anchor was lost on the east side of Cypress Island. This is, this is Anacortes right here. Um, Lopez Island, what my head, what my head, where Bill lives, uh, but lost off, lost off here. Their plan was to meet at Cypress at Strawberry Bay here. Uh, the anchor was believed lost here. That it was also believed that the ships were traveling together, and that the HMS Chatham, while they were traveling together, was swept in, swept to the eastward of Cypress Island, and that's where they lost their anchor. That's the conventional wisdom. You'll notice where we found our anchor. And it's really interesting. I found it didn't just, it wasn't just something that developed. It was, or, or, or stayed, it was never anything stated clearly. It was lost. Nobody ever said that in, in, in the journals. But I did find that uh, Robert Whitebrook in 1959 in his coastal exploration of Washington, he said, it probably still lies on a rocky ledge in the southwestern part of Ellingham Channel, encrusted with barnacles and covered with seaweed. Well, he was right on half of that. Let's put it out. But interestingly enough, it probably, it was a suggestion by Whitebrook. But within 20 years, it was gospel truth that the anchor was lost in Ellingham Channel, and everybody was looking for it there. I call it the mother bird syndrome where the mother bird feeds its youth, regurgitates food, feeds its youth, the, the young birds grow up, they regurgitate food, and they feed their youth, and so on and so forth from generation to generation. That's exactly what I think happens with historians, in that they don't, they don't uh, do original research. They just take for, for verbatim what somebody has told them from the previous generation. Multiple explorations have occurred in Bellingham Channel. A lot of money was expended as late as 2012. A quarter of a million, but from what I understand, it was a quarter of a million dollars with side scans, sonar, with magnetometers, <laughs> with video cameras, and two ships in a small area, one mile by three miles long, at its widest point, one mile, one mile long, or wide. And guess what they found? Nothing. But in 2008, Doug Monk discovered an 18th century Old plan, long shape, admiralty anchor in Admiralty Bay, nearly 30 miles south of Bellingham Channel. And an archaeologist, and I won't give that archaeologist's name, but and a leading Northwest historian stated specifically when Doug was trying to get possession of the ownership of it that this was not 
the Chatham Anchor that was in the wrong location. So, how did I get involved? Well, about a year and a half after Doug found it, I was having lunch with a mutual friend of Doug's and mine. I didn't know Doug at this time. And, and he, was a, he was a compatriot, a, work, a, work, a workmate with mine. And we were having a sandwich. And he started talking to me about all the wrecks that are in Lake Washington. You know, airplanes right off of here. Um, you know, you name it. Military gear, you know, railroad cars, boats, etc. And so I asked him, I said, do you actually ever dive in the salt? And he goes, well, yes, I do. And I'm like, then he tells me about Doug finding this anchor. Well, he said, he said, well, I, he says, I think I, he found the Chatham anchor. Well, I was taking a bite of my sandwich and I nearly <laughs> choked up. I 